Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Uh, Father God, we uh, humbly come before you uh, to uh, learn more about you. Um, we pray that you would bless this study to the edification of your people, uh, that it would build them up and equip them uh, to do the work of the ministry. Um, pray that you would uh, use me uh, to speak your truth. And uh, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, so just a quick qualification. I'm not Jared. I'm not Matt. I don't often ever teach or speak publicly. Um, so this is not my cup of tea. Um, so bear with me. Um, I don't know this is going to go. Um, Uh, hopefully you all know me. Um, there, I don't know how much of this will be interactive. Um, you know, I imagine it in my head, and it is, but maybe it isn't. But so feel free to um, ask questions or answer the questions. Some of them will be very obvious. Um, so we're talking about justice. Um, Jared talked about truth, objective truth, last week. Um, and so basically we're just laying a foundation um, so that we can, in light of God's word, address the topics um, involved in wokeness. And uh, so I think one of the key misconceptions in that movement is their conception of justice. Um, so we want to have a biblical conception. And so that's what we're going to try and do today. Um, questions we want to ans answer in this, at least to some degree. Uh, what is justice? How does it relate to grace and mercy? Uh, where does it come from? How do we know it? And why is it important? Um, so hopefully by the end we'll at least have a, an idea of where to get the answers. This, uh, this study will certainly not be exhaustive. Um, so why is it important? Um, Gordon Clark said, if you can't define your terms, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, I think that's definitely true of this word. And the ones who will define it, I don't think take into account all that scripture says about the word. Uh, Clark also said, if a word can mean anything, it means nothing. And then another man, Calvin Beisner, um, added that if a word means contradictory things, it is meaningless. And I think that's also true of justice. We hear... Um, we need minimum wage laws in the name of justice. But then you also hear the exact opposite. We don't need minimum wage laws in the name of justice. Uh, we need reparations in the name of justice. We don't need reparations in the name of justice. We need free health care in the name of justice. We don't need free health care in the name of justice. Uh, abortion is a right because of, because of justice. Abortion ought to be illegal because of justice. Um, so it's obvious that at least some people don't know what this word means. Um, and then specifically for the church um, and kind of the social justice, um, even the social gospel of the past, um, ideas that are coming into the church, uh, we need to rightly divide the word of God so that we can rec recognize wolves and the doctrines of demons that try and come into the church. And then we need to have a theology that is ordered, fully developed, and gives us direction in our lives. Um, if you look at this, uh, some of you can't see it, but regarding the how does justice relate to grace and mercy, a couple different views, and I think you can find all of these views within prof professing Christian churches. Um, justice and grace and mercy, it's an either or. You either get justice or you get grace and mercy. Um, and so in that, they're kind of like opposites. Um, but then... Some people view them as synonyms. Um, and usually, if you have that view, then you eventually get to a universalist position. Um, and then the other one would be that they're just unrelated. You know, we're talking about color and numbers. You know, green is not related to five. Um, and then I'd also add that uh, error loves a vacuum. 
if we don't have a clear biblical understanding of these ideas, then the secular ideas are going to impose themselves on us, which I think is what has been happening. So, uh, I think the place to begin in looking into this is the character of God. Um, so, a couple passages. Um, you don't have to follow these. Um, I'll read them. The others later that uh, we'll want to read together. But Psalm 9, 7, and 8. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. And he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. Psalm eleven seven. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. And uh, I should have mentioned this. Um, the word justice in the Bible is usually only translated justice when it's in relationship to like a uh, a, judici a judicial uh, legal case. Um, so a lot of times righteousness or righteous is what we would use as justice. Um, so in this, I think this could be read, for the Lord is just, he loves just deeds, and the upright shall behold his face. So in, in a lot of these, the word righteous is the word that is translated just, justice. Um, Psalm eighty nine fourteen. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. So again, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Uh, Psalm 99, 4. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Um, so I think it's clear from Scripture, and this is a very light sampling, that God is just. Um, the question is, is God always just? Um, so a couple more passages. Romans 3, 5 and 6. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? So the question, is God unrighteous? I speak in a human way. By no means. And Romans 3, 5 and 6. Then also in Romans uh, chapter 9, uh, 10 through 14. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. That brings up the question, well, that sounds like injustice to me. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Um, so I think the um, I think it's an important idea that we have about God is that He is always just. Everything He does is just. I think that's a testament of Scripture. Um, so in trying to, okay, we know God is just, but that's still, what is justice? What does that look like? Um, there's some very clear passages. Just weights, uh, Deuteronomy 25, 13 through 16. <clears throat> you shall not have in your bag two kinds of weights, a large and a small. You shall not have in your house two kinds of measures, a large and a small. A full and fair weight you shall have, a full and fair measure you shall have, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord God is giving you. For all who do such things, all who act dishonestly, are abomination to the Lord your God. So the idea here um, 
is in ancient times a merchant selling grain or buying grain. Somebody comes to bring him grain and he's going to buy it for, in our terms, $10 a pound. So he takes his weight and he's got two weights. He's got a light one and a heavy one. So when they're bringing the grain, he takes his heavy weight, puts it on there, and weighs out a, a pound of the wheat, flour, whatever it is, and gives them the $10. But what he's actually done is taken more than the weight, because he's used a heavy weight, not an actual pound. And then same thing when he goes to sell. He's selling grain. He takes his light weight, puts it on the scale, measures out the flour to even it, even it out, and then sells that. But what he's actually done, instead of selling a pound, he sold less than a pound. So that's the idea of these just weights and measures. Um, and similarly, similarly in Proverbs, Proverbs 16, 11, a just balance and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. Um, and then contrasting that, unjust bribes, Proverbs 17, 23, uh, to get an idea what injustice is, or injustice. The wicked accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the ways of justice. So here we have the way of justice and it's perverted by somebody accepting a bribe in secret. So they say, make it look like they're ruling impartially, but in fact, behind their back, they've been received a gift. And so they're not being impartial. They're favoring whoever has given them the bribe. Um, and then just judgments. Deuteronomy 1, 16. Through 18, hear the cases between your brothers and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the alien who is with him. He shall not be partial in judgment. He shall hear the small and the great alike. He shall not be intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God's. So here again we have to, impartial. The alien, your brother, whoever it is, you judge it and you decide on the case, not on who it is. Don't be intimidated. Um, by a powerful man. Um, and then also Leviticus 19.15. He shall do no injustice in court. He shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness so you judge your neighbor. So again, impartial. Um, so from that, I think we can start to get an idea of a beginning definition, and we'll read one more passage. Uh, Romans 2, 6 through 11. This is talking about God. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. So from these, um, and this is uh, not my definition, this comes from the Oxford Declaration on Christian Faith and Economics, um, from January 1990. Uh, they define justice as impartially rendering to everyone their due in conformity with the standards of God's moral law. Um, and if you can get somebody to define it, I think this is where what they'll say. Something very, very similar to this with impartiality, um, getting your due. Um, And that would be um, clear enough if that was all we had, but we have some perplex perplexing passages. Um, so this first one I'll just read. Matthew 1, 19. 
And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Um, so Mary is found with child. She's not married to Joseph. Joseph knows it's not his. So to, in every case besides this one, this would be a case of adultery. So that's definitely what Joseph, Joseph is thinking. So the punishment for this would be death. Is that, well, first of all, the, uh, the passage here, your Bible probably has man in italics or something saying that that's not in the text. Um, uh, the passage really reads, and her husband Joseph being just and unwilling. Um, but is that what you would think of? Somebody who, rather than obeying the Old Testament law, instead decides to be what I would think would be gracious to her. But instead, he's called just for doing this. Seems like if it's going to say just, it seems like, and Joseph, being a just man, had her stoned in the courtyard. Or, with what it does says, and Joseph, being a gracious man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So I don't think this passage fits in with our typical initial def definition of justice. Um, and then next, Matthew 20. Uh, this would be a little bit of a longer passage if, if you want to follow. Matthew 20, 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Um, in other versions, he says, uh, as he's hiring the subsequent workers, uh, whatever is just, I will give you. So a couple points of this. So the last man who worked all day received what they agreed to, which seems just. He thought he was going to get more, but he got the... He got his due. Those that didn't work the full day, those that only worked one hour, what would, again, not knowing the end of this passage, what would be just for them to get if you worked one out of 12 hours? One twelfth. One twelfth. And likewise, three twelfths, six, a half. Um, but he was just and giving them more than they expected. So it was just for him to give what he agreed to with the one, the one man, but it was also just of him to give more than what was expected, more than what we would think right. Um, and again, that doesn't fit in with everyone gets their due. Um, Psalm 112. So 
Psalm 112, 5 through 9. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. The rest of this is going to talk about this man. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. So this is a man who conducts his affairs with justice. So what does that look like? He distributes freely and gives to the poor. Again, does that fit in with impartially rendering to each their due? But this is called a just man. Um, and then lastly, uh, justice revealed. Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith, the just shall live by faith. Um, there are a couple of interpretations of this. Um, basically dealing with the, talking about the righteousness of faith, saying that is the righteousness that we have through faith, that comes through faith and not the, our inherent righteousness. What if that righteousness, um, if, we trans if we use justice, which I think is a totally valid translation of that, for in the gospel, the justice of God is revealed. I would think that verse would say, for in the gospel, the grace of God, the justice of God. And then slowly, pages over, Romans 3, 5. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Again, if our unrighteousness serves to show the justice of God, how does our unrighteousness show the justice of God? I would think our unrighteousness shows the grace of God in his forgiveness. Um, but this says that our unrighteousness shows the righteousness of God. So let's take a step back, see what do we know for sure. God is just. God is always just. God is sometimes, but not always, merciful. So going back to that relationship between justice and grace and mercy, what does that say about it? I apologize that everybody can't see the... If God is, al God is always just, but he's sometimes merciful, can justice and mercy be opposites? If justice and mercy are opposites, then God is, when God is always just, he's ne he can never be merciful. So if these are true, which I think they are, God is always just, and he's sometimes, but not always, merciful, they can't be opposites. Um, can they be the same thing? Can they be synonyms? If God is always just, then God would always be merciful if they're synonyms. So that can't be the, the right view. Um, so thinking more um, regarding people, some people get what they are due slash have earned slash deserve, um, not just in this life, but ultimately some people will go to hell and suffer the punishment that they deserve. And God is just in this. Some people don't get what they are due, slash have earned, slash deserve. 
Some people will be in heaven, which they did not earn. God is just in that. So how do we reconcile this? Uh, We have to look at what I'm calling uh, God's moral economy. And by that I mean um, the laws that govern the exchange of moral value. Um, which it's not really important, and I don't. I won't say that I have that totally worked out. If that's the exactly what I mean by it, but it's sufficient for now. So, how does it all work? Why does it all work? Does God just forgive and grant righteousness to us? At no cost. Matt says no. No, God does not just forgive us and grant righteousness. If he doesn't, who paid your debt, lived your righteousness, and earned your reward? Christ. Was that coerced or freely paid? Freely paid. Why did it happen that way? Um, Matthew twenty six thirty nine. My Bible doesn't have verse numbers in it, so it's sometimes hard for me to find stuff. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So why did it have to happen this way? Yes. Um, No. um, Well, why did it happen that way? It was part part of the plan of salvation. I mean, we saw shadows of that through the Old Testament, the sacrifice and the the spotless innocent lamb, and without the shedding of blood, there's no wish to see them. It was the plan that was. Right, as when Jesus prayed this, when he said, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, did God hear that prayer? Did he hear it and answer and say, Yes, it is possible, but I want you to suffer needlessly? Or did he say, There is no other way? There was, there is no other way that this could have happened. It was impossible. So why did it have to happen that way? Why was it impossible for this to work out any other way? Um, Romans three, twenty-one through twenty-six. And we'll spend a little bit of time on this passage. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put, for, put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, 
because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Um, so that's, there's a ton in that passage. Um, so specifically, looking at verse 25 and 26, who was put forward? Jesus. Jesus. By whom? God the Father. What was he put forward as? That's propitiation. The, the meaning of that is an, an atoning uh, or an atonement, um, something to appease a God. What did this show? God's righteousness. Why did this need to be shown? Why did God's righteousness need to be shown? And again, this righteousness could very thousandly be translated justice. Why did God's justice need to be shown? Yes, but I'm looking for specifically in the text. Why this was to show God's righteousness. Why was it to show God's righteousness? He had passed over former sins. What does that mean? This one's not in there. Yes, but with the uh, the passing over, like that's all true. Passing over the former sins is talking about those past sins. God had not punished those past sins, right? Um, how does that make God look? God not punishing those past sins. If that just continued indefinitely, he look unjust. He look unjust, and isn't that what the might be right here implies? He did these things so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in him. If God had not done those things, he would not be. Without Christ's propitiatory death, God would in fact be unjust in his divine forbearance of not punishing the sins of his elect people. That is why it was impossible that the cup could pass from Christ. God is just. Payment for sin must be made. The sacrificial death of Christ not only brings us into right relationship with God, but it resolves what would otherwise be injustice in God. So, taking that, um, where does justice come from? Character of God. How do we know it? His self-disclosure, the Bible. Why is it important? We're commanded to do justice. 
It's part of God's essential nature. Um, how does it relate to grace and mercy? Grace and mercy are justice, but justice is not grace and mercy. They are not opposites nor synonyms, but grace and mercy are a subcategory of justice. But what is justice? I think we can definitely say that the previous definition is insufficient for what the Bible says. So, and this is 100% mine and needs to, could, I'm sure, be revised in certain ways. Um, but justice is the rule of God's moral economy found in nothing other than his own character and will. Specifically, justice is that quality of an action, decision, or judgment pertaining to payment slash punishment being made for contractual, covenantal, or obligatory services slash breaches of duty, either directly or by an able and willing authorized substitute. Um, so let's see what that looks like. Caleb will be my, um, my example. So, say Caleb breaks my dad's window in his car. They're out in the yard throwing football, breaks the window. Caleb goes to dad and says, hey granddad, I'm sorry. I've been saving up money. Here's $500. That'll cover your getting a new windshield. Is justice served? Has payment been made? Yeah, justice is served. That'd be personal justice. We pay our own debt. Substitutionary. So same thing. Caleb breaks another window. Uh, Jeremy was out there playing with him, though. <laughs> and Jeremy uh, knows that Caleb doesn't have any money anymore. So Jeremy goes to debt and says, hey, Bill, Caleb broke another window. Here's $500. Is justice served? Payment's been made. So that'd be substitutionary justice. Okay, well, what about forgiveness? Caleb breaks another window. <laughs> he goes to Granddad and says, Granddad, I'm sorry, I broke your window. And Dad says, Don't worry about it, Caleb. I'll cover it. But in that, who actually paid the debt? Was well, Granddad going to drive around in a car with no windshield? He's paying for it. It looks like nobody's paying for it, but granddaddy's paying for it. If a bank forgives a loan, does that money just, debt just vanish? They have to write it off their books. They take the loss, they, they pay it. Um, and so three counter examples. So Caleb, <laughs> quit throwing that football, man. Caleb breaks another window. Dad comes to me and says, hey, Seth, you owe me $500. Caleb broke my window. <laughs> Is that just served? Why not? Did you say no? I didn't break the window. And I'm, I'm, un, I'm unwilling. I could pay it. I have the money. But I didn't agree to that. So I'm unwilling. Caleb tosses, <laughs> Caleb tosses another one. Crash. Silas goes to Granddad. Says, Granddad, I've come to pay Caleb's debt. Silas doesn't have any money. So he tries to pay it, but he doesn't. 
is justice served. He was unable. And then Caleb, right before he retires from football, <laughs> makes one more bomb, breaks into other dad's windows. The government steps in and says, we're paying it. There's justice served in that. Are they authorized? Is that what we've pay our taxes for? <laughs> to cover broken windows by, by Caleb. <laughs> no, that would not be just because that's unauthorized. Um, so, getting to real world issues, problems. Universal health care. Uh, how does that fit into those, that definition of justice that we have? Universal health care, um, when I was fined for not having health care, did they take, did, did I gladly give that money away? When our insurance went up to cover uninsured people, was that willingly that we did it or was it because the government had said, you have to? So, yeah, this is unjust on several levels. Um, minimum wage laws. Back to the, and this is a little bit more of the jurisdiction argument. Um, Matthew 20, that passage at the end of it, take what belongs to you and go, I choose to give this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? If I want to sell my labor, for five dollars an hour? Do I not have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Or rather, should I not have the right? Yeah, this is uh, the government stepping into a area that it does not have jurisdiction. So that's an unjust. But that passage that I just said, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? That's exactly the passage that somebody would quote, with abortion. Exactly. My body, my choice. And that's true insofar as it is your body. But an unborn baby is not your body. What would happen if I neglect my children? What if I neglect them so much so and intentionally that they die? Yeah, possibly be executed. Because, back to our definition, parents have an obligation to their children. A mother has an obligation to her children. That's not a contract or a covenant. It's nothing that they agreed to. It's something that God imposes on us. Parents have an obligation to their children. Um... So is abortion, is that a, is that just? Yes, Camila. Just a question about that. I'm thinking about how people would argue it. Um, obviously, I'm the life, but um, what if somebody said, I did not alter it and use my body for the growing of a child, and I did not agree to um, have obligations to raise a child? Well, that's what I'm saying. These are not, these are obligations imposed by God. And... Thankfully, society recognizes them, at least to some, to some extent. They don't recognize it if your child is unborn, but they do recognize it once your child is born. Um, yeah. The, but so let's take one of the most ex extreme cases, um, a rape victim. 
So first we need to acknowledge that sometimes in this world, justice will not and cannot be served. God will make everything right in the end. But here, at times, there is no just outcome. But what is definitely not the answer is to do more injustice because of past injustices. So, yes, you have a child against your will, but it wasn't, you suffered an injustice. That does not give you the right to impose an injustice on your unborn child. Uh, um, and so then lastly, reparations. So again, some justices cannot be rectified in this world. Was American slavery an injustice? Yes. Are any slaves still alive? Any children of slaves? At least in America? Any slave owners still alive? Children of slave owners? I, I doubt any children's. I doubt any children of slave owners. I, we may be getting to the point where there are not even any grandchildren of slaves and slaves owners. I'm not sure, but we're getting close to that. Uh, I saw a statistic that I think only about 5% of the population is a direct descendant of slave owners. So taxing the entire population, when many of them are descendants of people who fought and died in a war that ended slavery, and others' families were not even in the country at the time, is not only not just, but a larger injustice. The best way to acknowledge the injustices of the past that cannot be rectified is a commitment to justice now. Say that again. Uh, just that last bit. Mm -hmm. the, largest. the best way to acknowledge the injustices of the past that cannot be rectified is a commitment to justice now. So, with uh, these are obviously hot button issues um, in our political climate. Um, and so there may be some pushback on some of these saying, well, universal health care is the only way some people can get health care. Or minimum wage laws allow me to make enough to provide for my family. Uh, so first off, I don't know that those statements are true. They're hypothetical. Um, and I have to believe, because of God's word, what he says about justice, that people in a society established on justice rather than injustice would be better off. Now, that's not to say that no one has ever been helped through injustices or unjust policies. I'm sure minimum wage laws have helped people. Universal health care has helped people. But to um, uh, make an exaggerated example, if someone steals a thousand dollars and gets away with it, materially, they are better off. They were helped by that. That does not make it just. If I take all of Ellie's toys and give them to Lilo, materially, Lilo is going to be better off. But that's not just. Um, 